nonprofit home touches an issue that I have pondered my entire adult life. So I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to share some thoughts with you and to, to let you hear some of the things that have happened to me, some of the experiences I've had and responses to them. I hope it may help you understand part of what you're facing because I think this is a topic that all of us at all times and all places must confront. Now my story begins with, with the problem of home because I, I grew up on a ranch near Cotula and very happily Laredo was the big city we came here for a big time uh, but, I, but for reasons that I still can't quite explain I ended up going to the northeast for my university experience and I'm, unfortunately, if you're a Texan, you leave Texas to go to school, you're supposed to say you hate it, you're supposed to say you, we heard uh, Mr. Cosgrave, they cried on the plane, um, they were homesick. I loved it. I was very happy. I discovered at the university things I never even imagined. Curiously enough, and this will make you laugh, the thing that I discovered that I most enjoyed and adored was Spanish. Spanish. My parents, I was going to major in Spanish. I spoke Spanish all my life. My mother was a Spanish teacher. Spanish was a part of our life. You went to the Northeast to study Spanish? Yes, I loved it. It was wonderful, it was exciting. It was everything I could possibly hope for. The Spanish mystics, Santa Teresa, San Juan de la Cruz. Then I heard J.S. Bach play the organ. Oh, I only learned to play these pieces. So I was very, very happy. And I never planned to come back to South Texas, except to visit. Because I thought that to have those things, I needed to be in the place where I first studied those things. Then I came home to Laredo one summer. I met the love of my life. I proposed to her on the second date. Um, 30, 38 years later, we're still very happy. And, and I have been home to Laredo. And she and I together found, we had our three daughters here, we found in Laredo the most exhilarating, demanding, exciting, rewarding, blessed life we could possibly have imagined. So tonight I want, to, I want to think with you about what home means and, and how, how do you get to one, from one extreme to the other. First, let's think for a moment about home. Think of all the words that we use for home. Homeland, home base, homeward, home, head home, go home, come home, at home, homecoming, home run, home cook, reach home, call home, home fire, homemaker, homebound, and homesick are the two examples I can think of that sound a little negative. Everything else I read you are all positive emotions. Homebound, well, it's bad to be bound, but if you're going to be bound, be at home. So home kind of takes away the bad part of bound. Sick, it's bad to be sick, but if you're thinking about home, that's actually a nice thing. To say I was homesick never makes people feel bad. It always is a good thought. Think about it. Home is the only word I can think of that has the power that it does to evoke emotions in all of us that I don't think has ever descended into any obscene, or blasphemous expression. Now, if you, every other word like it, we have obscene and blasphemous uses for it. If you think of one, I would like very much afterwards to hear it. I can't think of one. Now, this is an old topic. Western literature begins with two poems that talk about home and leaving home. The Iliad and the Odyssey. In the Iliad, the Iliad begins, Achilles is sitting outside the walls of, of Troy, laying siege to the city, one of the Greeks laying siege to the city, and he is, he's there because he, the identity he most desired, a warrior, a man strong, a man who doesn't give in, a man who doesn't back down, that's the person he made of himself. That's what he required. This is where he led him. The other poem, the Odyssey, a guy named Odysseus. Odysseus is like Achilles, but when the war ends, Odysseus lives over it, and he spends the rest of the poem, very long, making his way back home. Two men leave the same vision for themselves, which they created, they abandon their home, one of them comes back. Now, to make a home, to create a home, there, there is almost no expression, no thought more warm and more encouraging than that idea. I think that we experience home in two forms, and I want to, I want to think with you briefly about each. First, the home that we're born into. We are born at a certain time to certain people in a certain place with certain circumstances, and we have absolutely no control over that. You can't even change, you can't adjust that fact. Some people try to hide it or alter it, but they always get found out. So now it's argued about, but the truth is always discernible, and you can't alter it. Now, um, if, if, if 
what happens to you in that home has a tremendous effect upon you. Do people read to you? Do they speak to you? Do they speak to you in clear language, in mature language, or do they talk baby talk to you? Do they do they love you? Do they are you warm? Are you fed? Are you protected? Or are you or do you feel threatened or hostile? The environment that you grow up in has a tremendous impact upon the person you are. And it's it, it, it's something that we have absolutely no control over whatsoever. Whether it's blessed or, 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 or secure or, or, or hostile or harsh, those first formative years have a tremendous impact on the person that we become. At, at, at the point that we begin to move away from that is the point that we begin to grow. And the process of growing and moving away from home can be a very painful one. Uh, think about the famous examples of leaving home that we have. The most the first one that I can think of is in the Bible when Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden. The angel stands there with a sword and they can't go back. James Berry wrote a book, Peter Pan, about how, how terrible it is to leave childhood and how, how it, maybe it's better not to cross the line because once you become an adult, you can't go back. The phrase, you can't go home again, is one of the most chilling we have. And adulthood, in a very real way, means a closing of that door. You can't go back. At the same time, the process is one of the most exhilarating things that can happen to you. In that process, a tremendous amount of pain can occur, but at the same time, a tremendous liberation. I want to tell you, give you two examples, one very painful and one that actually saves an entire nation. The first one comes from Don Quixote. This is a book I read in college that changed my life forever. Don Quixote taught me that, that who you are is a made thing. You're not the person you were born. Yes, you are. I told you, you can't change that. But you're also the person you decide to be. So in the end, you make who you are. That's the story of Don Quixote. There's a very famous episode in there. Don Quixote meets a young man named Lorenzo. And Lorenzo is, is very upset with his parents and is trying to get away from his home because Lorenzo wants to be a poet. His father is a very nice man, very kind man, moderately Comfortable, not wealthy, but comfortable man. But he's not, his thinking is not very inspired. A poet? He wants to be a poet? Absolutely not. Don Quixote intervenes, and after a long exchange, father, son, Don Quixote, son, Don Quixote, and father, finally, Don Quixote, in, in a very famous part of the book, tells him, Vuestra merced tiene que dejar a su hijo caminar por donde su estrella le llama. You must let your child follow his star. Go where his star calls him. And the father accedes, listens, and lets Lorenzo go to be a poet. We don't know if Lorenzo gets old and hungry and comes back, but, but <laughs> at least for now, that painful process of leaving your home and establishing a second one, a home that this time is an identity, a person different from the one you began, is at least, this is at least in place for Lorenzo. The other example that I want to share with you is even is much more dramatic than that. This comes from an essay by a man named George Steinman, and the, the title of the essay is Our Homeland, the Text. And he's, he, his subject is the fact that the Jewish nation has no homeland. How can, how can the Jewish nation have survived for 2,000, the last temple was destroyed set in approximately year 70 of the Common Era. So 2,000 years, no home. The year I was born, 1948, the year Israel was, was first uh, organized as a nation. It's a long time not to have a place to be, and yet the Jewish people continue to continue to continue. Why? Because their home was the book. And Steiner makes the point that every reading Every return to, the, to the, read the book was a return to our homeland. So the person that you set out to become, the person you decide to be, the identity that you make for yourself, can be something that, that becomes, it has no place, it has no time, it's inside you, it's part of your soul, it's part of who you are. In the case of the Jewish nation, it saved an entire people from oblivion. Now, how do, we, how do we finally think about these two homes and, and, and what, they, what they imply in our lives? Um, do we, 
is it necessary to give up one in order to have the other? Can you, if, if to, to embrace a dream, does it mean that you must turn your back on your family and the person you were born to be? Is it possible to reconcile those two? I believe that the greatest chance you and I have for happiness is to, over time, and it doesn't happen in a hurry, over time, reconcile those two identities, bring together those two sides of ourselves. The person that we began because we just happened to be there, and the person that we decided that we wanted to be, that we wanted to be, that we set out to be, that person that we, that we asked uh, in, in life to help us become that soul inside us that we develop as an adult. Now, the, the um, story of, of Achilles has an interesting ending on this, on, on this issue. Achilles was very aware that if he stayed and fought, he was probably going to die and he would never go home again. He would never see his home again. If, on the other hand, if he died, he would become famous. So he would become forever. He would cease to be that person going home. And he would become the person that he created. And I want to read you his words from Book 9 of the Iliad. They're very moving, and they, they say it very clearly. If I abide here and play my part in the siege of Troy, if I stay here and fight it out, and then lost, then lost is my return home. But my renown shall be imperishable. But if I return home to my dear native land, lost is my glorious renown. Yet shall my life long endure, neither shall the doom of death come upon me. If I stay, I'll never go back to my dear native land. He loves where he came from. He's not upset. He's not running away from it. But he'll never see it again if he decides to stay there and dies. But who is he? He's a soldier, a man dedicated to a cause, a man committed to a position, and he would prefer that. And the fame that goes with not backing down, honoring that identity to returning to the identity they left behind him. So he, he stays and he dies. Odysseus, very different man, decides the war ends, he's alive, he's going to make his way back home. And the Odyssey is the, the long, slow story of how he makes his way back. He gets back to his dear native land. He comes back to his wife, his children, his family, everything he left. Odysseus is able to put the two back together. Achilles said, I will not bend, I will not give, and that's all right, I'll be famous, this is who I am. Odysseus says, you know, maybe there's a way we can work this out. <laughs> and in the end, he comes back and, and all is restored. So I, I, I ask you tonight, uh, which of these two, these are the two, this, I mean, Euro European literature, Western literature begins with these stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Which of these two resonates with you? I'm very grateful that I got to be Odysseus and find my way back and discover this was the best possible place to imagine for me. Now, I want to, I want to end by, by asking you to, to look at this at a picture of a very famous sculpture. This is in Rome, in the Galleria Borghese. It's by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Bernini did this almost exactly the year the pilgrims left England to come to America. He did this in 1619. So in 1619, I'm sure the, the Mayflower was getting put together and they were planning to get on it. Um, it depicts a very famous scene in the Aeneid by Virgil. This is, a, it's all, we're, we're at the Battle of Troy again. Troy has just fallen. The Greeks have destroyed the city. They've gotten in. Remember the story of the Trojan horse? Now they got in. That's all happened. And everybody's leaving, trying to get away to save their lives. Aeneas is a prince. He's a, a man of importance in the city. But now he has nothing. So he's trying to leave. But he's, he's kind of weighted down, as you can see. Do you suppose he's carrying on his shoulders? He's carrying his father. That's his ancient, aged father that he's put on his shoulders. And in his hand, in the father's hands is a vessel, and in the vessel are the ashes of their ancestors. At this point, it, it, people burn, people all cream, all, all dead bodies were cremated. People save the ashes. In the flight. The old man takes the ashes of his ancestors with him. On the top of the, the ash can, it's really better than that, it's not quite an ash can, there are two little figures. These are the Penanthes. These are the house deities. These are the little 
the little santitos that take care of the heart in the house. Now, they didn't do a very good job because they're having to run away. But, <laughs> but, como quiera, they're going to take them with them, so they're there. If we in Laredo were trying to flee, we would grab them something, we'd probably grab our favorite, my little pan or our favorite santito, and start for the door. Well, that's exactly what this is. That's where our tradition comes from. That's what they're doing. The little boy around the corner is Aeneas' son. He's coming too. So think about it. This man, young, strong, Aeneas is in his early 20s. If he doesn't bother with his father, he doesn't bother with his son, and for heaven's sakes, leaves the ashes and the santitos that didn't even help him. If he just leaves the whole thing behind, he can get away a lot faster, can he? But he doesn't. He takes them. Art critics have looked at that statue and said, but it's too top heavy. It, 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 it doesn't make sense. That's the whole point. Of course it's top heavy. And yes, his life is top heavy. It's his father and the father's ancestors. The little boy is there. But the little boy is hanging on behind and he is, is carrying his father. This, this famous scene in the Aeneid, dramatized in this sculpture, that, that desire to hold those two parts of ourselves together. The part that we are born into this world, discovering we are, and that part that our souls and our experience tell us we want to be. It has been my very great blessing to be able to, over time, see those two come together in my own life. It's what I hope for all of you. Thank you.